Hi, welcome to Write More Light. My name is Sarah with the Midwest Writing Center. And today I am introducing to you Chewy Renseria. Uh, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read Chewy's bio instead of um, telling everyone why I think he is excellent. Uh, <laughs> Chewy's a b-boy since the age of 14, a central figure in the Iowa dance scene, and is also this is outdated. Your bio is outdated. Oh no, is it the one that I gave you? <laughs> it's from your book. <laughs> Um, oh, oh yeah 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 <laughs> but anyway here's chewy and he takes <laughs> patootie uh, hello yeah i think that <laughs> that the, the thing that you're about to read was i was at hancher auditorium um and now i am in uh, a new unit on at the university of iowa i'm in and, and it's totally fine um it's inclusive education and strategic initiatives, which is a rebranding from diversity resources, which is all to say that I work with um, our diversity, equity, and inclusion kind of initiatives, our, our charges with that. But yeah, yeah, it's funny. It's like, if, you, if you're doing a lot of things, a lot of times your bios that are out there in the world are, uh, like you said, outdated. <laughs> I, said, I had someone, they didn't read my bio, this is like two days ago, um, they didn't read my bio, but they were like citing it <laughs> in a in a, a radio interview. And they were like, and you've got a lot of cats, huh? And I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> is I, my favorite is when you can tell somebody is interviewing you and they don't know anything about you, but your bio. And then, so it's just like, and you're like, oh, he's going to talk about my family next because that's the end. Right? Like, so yeah. It was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was lovely. And um, that was for uh, Scribble on WVIK. Um, it was for the, um, these interesting times anthology that the MWC press put out. Uh, and the, and he had clearly read my piece. Like he was, he was well-educated. He had good questions, but it was just like, uh, <clears throat> for those who don't know this, writers write their own bios. Um, which is why some of them are funny and some of them are serious and some of them have, you can, you can tell a person's priorities by their bio um, or what they're being told to write. That's also a thing. Um, but the end of my bio says that I have too many cats or something, something to the effect of many cats, too many cats, 30 cats. <clears throat> the reality is three. Um, <laughs> but it was just, it was really out of left field to, to hear that I have a lot of cats. Telling you that you have the cats. Yeah, and another interesting thing is, and I don't know if this is just the just the small regional press thing or if, if, or if it's kind of a, a common standard practice is uh, writing the blurb like on the inside jacket or like the, the like the descriptor of the book. I did mine, which which was very much like writing the, the bio. It's kind of a strange experience because with with the memoir it's like I was so it's such a personal obviously like personal story and I'm so close to it and then you're almost having to write like advertisement copy for yeah. that 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 really deep experience that you just like unloaded on the page and all of a sudden it's like okay what markets am I thinking about so it, I, I mean I was totally fine with with doing it but I thought it it definitely surprised me and that it's like okay now you're gonna write the the blurb on the back or you know, the blurbs are the wrong word the, the like you know the overall the summary yeah synopsis there you go um shoot i thought that um this book has been in my hand a lot lately um adverbs by daniel handler i was pretty sure on the back of this book he said that he like in the blur in the synopsis it says did you know authors get to write these <laughs> There you go. Yeah, so it is. It's like a common practice. It's, it's it's not what you would think. I don't know. Maybe it's because my background is in the performing arts and and you know dance specifically, or like my work with Hancher Auditorium. It's like everybody had their own little lanes and everybody had their expertises. So it's like you know the dancers dance and then the lighters light it and then the the, the marketers you know market it beforehand and the engagement folks do the things during and after and so it was it's all this it's very much like a communal thing and writing I would argue is a very communal thing it can be a very communal thing as well but there is that like oh no no you're gonna do this especially if you I think it's if you're starting out or in a or in a, in a more regional or smaller press it's kind of like 
you're you're it's very much like a DIY aesthetic right you're doing it because nobody else is going to yeah um yeah so I think it's a very common I don't think it's universal though uh, I'm gonna start asking the authors I know if they wrote their own cover copy mm -hmm. um I'm, I'm going to, this is going to be my new, my new project. Hey authors. Uh, <laughs> I know I have written, I've written one like for myself to, to pitch it. Um, which I haven't even finished a book. It's not like, <laughs> um, so I, I know at least a lot of people are asked for that. Um, uh, but yeah, that's weird to think about. I also want to say for, for folks who haven't written their own bios, it's not fun. It is not fun. Uh, I go for the uh, for for lighthearted because I cannot take myself seriously uh, in that context. It just feels too much. Yeah, yeah. So it, find an angle and just lean into it. You can fix it later. Yeah, I think it, it speaks to that conversation of to be a writer. You have to be at once very humble, but also like there's a level of confidence that you have to have that maybe depending on you uh, on who you are like borders on uh you know too much confidence we'll say right but it's like when you I, that's an interesting thing to think about it's like what does the way that you approach writing your own bio say about you i have this thing where um i say and I, i'm trying to pull it from the recesses of my brain but it's like you can tell a lot about a person by um when they when this phenomenon happens where they like are reading out loud and they come across a word they can't pronounce like they don't know the word and not the fact that they don't know it like you know we all don't know words but it's like what do they do when they don't know it right mm -hmm. there's those people that are just like you know and jack when i don't know that word and they just keep on going and then there's the people who try to sound it out in front of people or the people who who just like skip it completely i don't know i think that's such a fascinating thing because you're it's such a it can Definitely. be such a vulnerable thing yeah. right like we, for especially like if you've had issues with it or you know you know i think it is just for everybody it's a, it can be this vulnerable um connection with folks and if there's something that 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 there's like a little, little thorn that comes in between it it's an interesting kind of like case study on who you are yeah i'm i'm like of course i can't and here's an important thing, right? No one is thinking about you. Uh, <laughs> people only are thinking about themselves. I can't at all remember the way anyone else has ever reacted to this situation, but I'm thinking about how much you can tell about me based on what I do, which is pause and then gun it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's just a lot about, yeah. yeah. I, have a, I have a friend who every time he does, he's just like, oh, I can't read. Just like, you know, just like, oh, I can't read, you know? And I'm just like, dude come on like you, that's you're being hard on yourself like who cares right I'm but pretty insecure about my intelligence um but i think that the the gunning it <laughs> is a compensation for that where um you know if you kind of lean into ah oh, shucks i'm no good at this that's also a, a different kind of compensation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and it, it speaks also to um uh, you know, it was like a like a meme or something that went around where it's talking about the fact that if all you've done is read by yourself and not read it in front of other people or out loud, and and you you just in your head you pronounced it differently, like that 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 is not a fault of yourself, right? Um, it's just you know it, it it can speak to the fact that you are more like it's more of a, a private thing this reading that you do. Yeah, no, people should be. I mean. If you know how to use a word, like you should be, you should be maybe not proud of that, but kind of proud of that. There's no shame at all. Mispronunciation mm -hmm. is a is a construct anyway. Language was invented. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I love where this is going. I love how we're just like, we're just talking. <laughs> yeah. We could just go. I mean, yeah, I can go just like language and the 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 intricacy of it and 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 i i just i did a a classroom visit last week here on campus and it was specifically for like grad students it's very very um intimate conversation like i think it was like 10 students um it's I, whenever it's like saying students for like grad students who are like are my age or older right it's always like i always feel kind of like oh that's strange right but 
it it was interesting because I was talking to them a lot about the, the like who gets to place validity on language on 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 the way that you articulate words right like like people who use slang or who like have you know grew up in a different um country where they spoke a different language and then come to come to this country or vice versa or whatever and it's like their their language could be just as complex and intricate in their usages of, of these words as like the like academic or like the what are what has been historically considered these these like ways like these modalities of speaking that are 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 like lauded but it's like no the way that like 15 year old dancers like b-boys and b-girls talk about dance in such a like a like exciting and 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 new way it's like they should be lauded just as much as like these academics who have taken this kind of approach to to like writing my dissertation and thesis statement that I, I shouldn't use a voice right but it's like it's totally that right it's like i don't know i, I i'm fascinated by that yeah i um i was <laughs> i i was trying to play the game magic the gathering and I was trying to explain to these people who have played it, you know, for years and years that it, the, the cards are written in English, yes, but this is a different language. These words are not used in a way that I'm familiar with. These are words that I'm not familiar with. Um, these words have different meanings than, than what you may think. And if you're used to that, if you've been, you know, if you have any amount of skill scaffolding in this arena, which I don't even play video games, um, then then it comes much more naturally but even though it's um you know maybe a word that we use all the time in a different context it makes just make, it's a mystery um so like what you're saying with um well with anyone who has any kind of jargon um whether that's young dancers or um i guess old gamers <laughs> uh everything has jargon and we act as though you know, some is is more elite than others, but that's that's not the case. Like just because you've got your uh, your PhD in Xeno archaeology, um, I that was definitely I just pulled that from Star Trek or something. <laughs> I don't know what that was. <laughs> I actually my brain wanted to say, or my brain controlled that. I wanted to say ethnozoology, but which is a real thing, by the way. <laughs> I don't think xenoarchaeology is. I think that would just be archaeology. Yeah. Um, is that like xeno, like xenomorphs, like from Alien? <laughs> <laughs> okay, quick aside, because I love you. Um, did you see they're coming out with Reebok has alien shoes coming Ooh, out? Oh, no. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. I, I'm like three steps away from being a sneakerhead and... Um, I don't need to waste anyone else's time on that. <laughs> Being a sneakerhead is is rough right now. Like I I empathize with it. It's just like so expensive and any I mean, shoe that's that the comes greatest out. blessing. I'll never have the money to do it. <laughs> I'll also never have the patience to like clean shoes. Like I wear them outside so that I don't get dirty or hurt. Um, <laughs> anyway, <Yeah. laughs> um, so whatever it is that you're doing there's a jargon and there's no there's no elitism to that we just we structure our lives such that some people are allowed to act elite i think yeah for society not our lives yeah and it, it, it's this like those that are have power and those who have both like you know leverage in like a socioeconomic sense but also like a historical sense right who who I, I've talked to so many other specifically like writers of color where it's like who are the people who are the authors that your teachers and professors have have basically told you you should write like if you want to be a good writer and a lot of times it's like you know dead white men right and it's just like the language that they're using and the language that um and I thought, and, and it's almost until very recently, like the last five or 10 years where I've really thought about that and, and kind of thought about my own biases towards that aesthetic being the aesthetic that means good, right? Not even great, just like, if you're not, if you're not writing like that, you're not good. Like the whole idea of like, 
being very terse and like succinct, succinct in your language. And it, it became almost like my communicative skills, the way that I talked was, was like, I, re I didn't realize that I was like hitting a switch and writing differently than the way that I talked because I thought that it was just the way that you do it. And, it, and it's almost like now, as I get more comfortable with all of this stuff with language and, and the hierarchy of it, it's just like, I, I can do it in a different way than I, than I was taught to, um, yeah. So this is a really excellent segue actually to my, well, I mean, I prepare questions in advance, but I was not at all worried about it with you. <laughs> <laughs> so there's something that really, here's Chewy's book, by the way, I've talked about it, but I have not shown it to you. <laughs> very young. Um, the titular moment, by the way, made me cry. So everyone read this. Um, okay, it made me tear up. No, no offense. I just no, no, that's funny. A that's little funny. more to cry. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you you manage to have language that feels very conversational, very authentic, but is also really pretty. Um, and when I say pretty, I mean yeah, you know, close to lyric, right? It's um, it's it's artful. I'm just all the words are going to be vague. There are no specific words to define pretty yeah. um <laughs> and and so i'm wondering how how you oh i have lots of underlines in here um so that made me feel good because that's how much i like you from the outside um so so how do you navigate that with with your brain on this um we'll say old white man aesthetic um and you trying to tell a real story an authentic story a true story um yeah. In in the in in the voice that experienced it. Yeah, there, there's a couple of things I did. Some that were very intentional while I was going through drafts, and some that I had, you know, it, w w you know, when I'm doing my outline and summaries and talking to the folks that I'm trying to like pitch the book to. It's like I knew that I wanted to be, I wanted it to be conversational. I knew that I wanted it to not feel like this kind of like dry text right but there's other things that i that i didn't even realize i was really doing or it was this it's almost kind of like how you're when you're you're kind of the way that you're grappling with just like the qualifiers for it right like it's like lyrical or pretty it's like if you get too like if you get too in the weeds of it you'll lose it right so like there's a couple of things that i i didn't even realize i was doing um I will say up front, it's like, I wanted to make a, I wanted to write a story the way that I would tell it to my friends. And there was a couple of times that I literally like, I mean, cause some of these, I mean, these are, these are like tales of our childhood. Like it's, it's, I like, I've had some feedback from friends who've read it, who are like, one of the greatest compliments I've gotten so far about the book was somebody who was there at, at, at some of these events and they're like I could feel the weather on my skin is what he said just from your descriptions and I was like that's the one of the best comedy you know like that matters to me more than like a review in in, a, in a, like a lot of magazine or whatever it's like because that that he didn't have to say my review that. meant nothing to you yeah <laughs> <No>. <laughs> sorry sorry no, no, I had no, to no. make it about me <laughs> <laughs> no, that is that's that's real though. Um, mm -hmm. both from someone who whose story you're telling, sort of tangentially, I guess. Um, but also for the reader. I mean, that shows the effectiveness of the language. I mean, yeah. And I've had some kind of internal, you, you know, like trying to parse through it because it's like it's not like I dumbed it down, right? I wasn't trying to be like, I need to make this like simpler, but I, I did have times where I, I, I thought like, to me, it was, it was like a rhythm thing more than like the actual words. Like if the word made sense and it was, it was this like kind of, it was more of a, a you know, 50 cent word. If it, if it made sense and it said this, if it, if it, it like, gave the, the the feeling that I needed, then I'd use it. But it's like the rhythm of it had to make sense. And the rhythm of us talking to each other had to make sense. Um, and it was like adding that kind of stiltedness that can happen when, you, when you're when you doing like Spanglish or going from like transitioning from 
speaking to my parents who speak all in Spanish and I speak in English to talk to my friends. Like I, I needed to convey that feeling of like when I'm talking with my parents, even to this day, you have to like, pro it go, like your, your computer, your brain computer has to like process things a little bit more to get it out in a way that makes sense to them. Whereas like if I'm talking to my, nowadays, I think the best example is when I'm talking to my sister. Like my, my wife, when I get on the phone, if, if she walks into the room and I'm talking with my sister, she knows immediately that I'm talking to my sister, right? Um, a, because we curse like, say, like, <laughs> like all of a sudden I'm just like cursing every other word. And it's not like I'm like, it's, it would literally just be like me in my living room with my sister. Like, I'm not trying to be badass or whatever. It's just like, that's the way we communicate, right? But even just like the, I mean, kind of the way I'm talking to you right now is pretty close to like, I mean, it's like we code switch for everything, right? But not being inhibited by by you know like being nervous about making a mistake or, or having to process things for, for through language or like doing a job interview you're going to speak differently than when you are like comfortable and when you're comfortable is when you're like your most yourself I would argue and and so I was trying to somehow get that on the page which you know sometimes it didn't work there's times I had to go back and be like this, this this doesn't sound right this doesn't sound real or like honest and and yeah that was it could it, sometimes it was like striking whole pages and whole whole passages because I'm like it doesn't this isn't working that's got to be so hard uh I know I feel like having an, a full-length manuscript of any kind and then having to reread it is a labor um, but when that, when that story is yours and you have this mission, I mean, I don't know that this is your mission, but when, um, when you have this intention of, of being real with it, um, that's gotta be so much harder to, to, to sift through. This is like close to 300 pages, right? It's over 200. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, we cut, I forget how many. 60 pages from it I mean we cut tons and tons from it like there there's whole section there's a there's a whole story it's like it was supposed to be five stories and there being four because it just it just was going to be so hard to fit that one in there um yeah it it's what's the fifth one so the fifth one is you just give um, us like a headline yeah 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 um it's my friends and and families um struggles or or uh, feelings or interactions with religion mm. and, and it's like we grew up Roman Catholic and when I was a small child you know I I did I was baptized I did a, a like first communion I, I went to catechism um catechism is like you know like the the like kind of Sunday school but it, for us it was like Thursday nights um and so it was like very much tied to being like Mexican American, like Mexican American Roman Catholic. Um, our Asian friends in, in West Liberty are like Laotian friends, like they were Buddhist. Um, and as I grew older, our family became less and less religious, which I think happens to a lot of like immigrant families. Like when they come, they can hold on to this like religion piece, but as they get acclimated, they kind of they lose it. Um, I, 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 I wonder too if, we need it more when we're new. And that was new, meaning new to any experience, not. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was the place we, we had Spanish mass, right? That was the place on a Sunday morning where my parents could go. And even though it was this like white institution, they had like this white priest who could speak Spanish and he did the entire mass in Spanish, right? And like, that was the only, only, one of the few places that wasn't like a, a Mexican owned entity or, or, you know, it was families speaking to each other and, and owning this, it was like actually a part of the community that had this piece that people could see themselves in. But yeah, no, I totally agree. And um, the, the, the kind of the, the through line was uh, in catechism, they told us, if you're not Catholic, you're going to go to hell. And us as like 11, 12 year olds, old boys were like but what about our friend jerry our friend jerry said that he's buddhist like he's not catholic and they're like yeah he's not going to right and so it, my friends at one time we tried to convert him 
oh. Catholicism, right? And that whole thing. And and yeah, yeah. I mean, like it, it was really good. It was really, it's like it's still very like it's like I think it's like an amazing story, but we all agreed. We're just like, it's gonna be way too hard to like cut from all the cut accumulated like yeah. 90 pages from the rest of the manuscript. So yeah. But uh, so knowing, I mean, granted, I don't know any of your friends, um, but knowing them as I do from your book, I am desperate for this story. <laughs> um, that sounds like a hijinx. Um, I, I also grew up Catholic. My, um, my catechism teacher was super, super cool, though. Um, cool meaning like understanding that there's a world beyond her and, you know, you have to make you have to understand there's a larger context to life outside of um, the church. This sounds like probably sacrilege. I'm not even, I'm not gonna say her name. Don't want her to get in trouble. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I can't, I'm trying, I'm, even when you had, you had a couple scenes, not many in, in that classroom, the, the, your catechism classroom. And I saw it in my head as the one I was in. Um, mm. And so I, I don't know. Um, it, that felt familiar is my point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just remembering the, the, the prologue, the prologue where the, the high schoolers mm -hmm. like hurl like racist, um, remarks at me. And then I go to catechism and talk to the catechism teacher that was originally going to be in that story. So, so that the whole thing where it's like, we heard it when we were young and, and putting that piece together, that was going to be like kind of the culmination of the, of the, like the religion piece. And so when we we struck it, I I told them I'm like I'm fine taking it. It, it made the most sense because like in terms of like the full arc of it, mm -hmm. it, it just it was the easiest to pull out. But I told the editors I'm like, but we there's this one piece in here that like it has to be in here. It's it's the most kind of it's one of the most intense scenes, right? And we're just like screw it, let's put it at the very top. Like that, let's, yeah, yeah, that was a beautiful choice that that prologue is some of the most powerful especially as a prologue writing that i i can think of to to preface a story that way to 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 say you're gonna hear my life story and we're gonna start it out in the week like <laughs> what did you 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 told me in advance of my reading this book something that was like i don't know how do you how it was something about like it starts out like it starts going hard and it keeps going hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I read that and I was like, okay. <laughs> so he, actually, he wasn't joking. <laughs> yeah, I recorded it. I read it to I read it to my phone and sent it to like six people. And I was like, you guys, I know him. Thank you. Um, which is a um a, another segue. Uh, so I think this book. I'm touching it. You can't. Hi, people. Read the cover again. Um, I think this book is one of one of the the rare and and special situations in which you can give it to a non-reader um, without it without it being a chore. Which there's a lot of honestly classes talk about like why reading is so great, and there's a lot of reasons that reading is objectively really great. Um, but you know that goes into like comics aren't books and audiobooks aren't books and that's all trash yeah yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. if you're if you're consuming the story you're consuming the story but um should you should you wish to show someone that literature is not a classes situation is not a um there's no gate keeping you from it i think this is one of those books you know um for teen boys you give them like fight club um <laughs> <laughs> for um you know comics are a really great introduction mm -hmm. um but this this one for me i've i've been handing it out like halloween candy to adults who don't read who come from um who come from a background similar to mine uh and i don't know if any of them have read it but <laughs> um but because it's so so real and so familiar it I don't want to say it feels like home because that's not quite what I mean um or at least I think the 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 assumption is that home is a comfortable place and that's that's not what I mean it's not a comfortable book to read mm -hmm. um and and I think 
I think that's what we want when we read. We, we want to get a little bit outside ourselves, but we also want to be to want to be told that we're not alone. And um, this isn't a question, is it? I'm just talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, no, but I can I can totally like riff on that because <laughs> I I I think that speaks a, again to like I I wanted to write this for my friends, right? And and I think we've had this conversation before where I've talked Which to lots is, of- Why are you so great? <laughs> I, was, I was, took lots of work and practice, no. Um, I think we've had this conversation before about like, I, I've, I've been in rooms with lots of like white, authors and a, like a majority of them would say like I write for myself or I write for a version of myself I've heard I, I write for a, a childhood version of myself which are all very valid things you know but I, I've the the issue comes when somebody comes to me and it's like and then I write for myself too right like I you know, like there's I think it's it's a it's kind of a not a silly question but it's a it's a interesting question um, but like I can say for the memoir, memoir, like I wrote this for my friends, or another way to put it is like I wrote this for the people who grew up like I did, who grew up like we did, like other people in towns, other people who grew up like first generation. Um, more, more than I mean, like you know, maybe if there's like I could get into the weeds of like you know writing this for myself like this much, but in other people it's this much, you know, it's like, but that piece i've had more people come to me and say like i don't read but i loved your book right like i've had so many people come to me and say that right and i think that's in a lot of ways by design and if there was like parts of it where i i wanted to it to be very dynamic and i remember reading um parts of uh the autobiography of frederick Douglass, who was the, the freed slave and, and he talked about like, he put very like, you know, like violent things in there. He put things that like some people could consider to be like scandalous, whatever. And he wasn't afraid to like be visceral about things. And I think he said, because he wanted to, to like hook people that maybe don't think of themselves as readers, who maybe don't think of themselves as, as, as people who, who consume these really high level, manifestations of an issue right he needed to be like no this is this is how you relate and this is like this is conflict in a very like kind of uh, tangible way and so I took that to heart and I remember thinking about that when I was like doing the outline and be like I have to tee these up and I have to show how it's it's not just the conflict in our heads it's not just it's not just this very uh internal musings about generation identity and things like it's like it's outward like no my sister was trying to beat me up right like she threw a battery at my eye and I'm still my eyes still scarred from it right like like that needs to be in there too right and and you know it it, it I think there's I mean I've gotten feedback people like I I there's parts of it that I I it's hard for me to get through and I was like yeah like it was hard for me to live kind of through it you know <laughs> Um, so I will say, I'm like, I don't know how one could spoil a memoir, um, because you're alive and you exist and, and, and that's your life. Um, but I'm not going to be giving anything away. In fact, I will say, um, the end, not the ending, but like the end was a shock to me. Um, like it felt like we were wrapping up your story and then there was another story. Um, and I, I want to say too, like you tell a lot of really serious truths. You tell a lot of really intimate, hard stories about life. Um, but there's this final one, which I feel like is next level vulnerable uh, because it isn't as much a story as it is a um, confession maybe. Um, how do you do that? Like, how do you, how do you get, how do you get this vulnerable and, and like after the fact, right? So you, you wrote it and presumably you were alone and silent at the very least you were silent. No one knew what you were writing the moment you were writing it. Mm -hmm. Um, and now there are 
at least a few thousand people in the world who know like very intimate details of your life. How, <laughs> how does that work for you? Uh, and how did you make the decision to share it? Yeah, no, all, all really good questions. The reason and, I don't want to say what it is is because it was such a surprise to me. Um, and I think that that's good. I think it's effective that it came as a surprise. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also not like, it's very reasonable, it's very understandable, but like following the narrative, it didn't have, you know, life yeah. is not a book. Um, yeah, yeah. So there was no foreshadowing, I'll say. Yeah, and it and it totally, it, it's just that, yeah, it, it, it subverts this, um, this narrative that I think it's put out a lot about like the, the, person of color, the teenager, teenager, BIPOC teenager who, who finds themselves in sport or dance or, or some type of form. And, and that's how they pull themselves out of their, you know, their mm -hmm. upbringing and pull them up some, pull themselves up from their bootstraps, blah, blah, blah. And then it's just like, okay, but if you're not, if we, if we have lots of trauma in our childhood that, that we don't parse through and we don't, um deal with that that's it's gonna come back it's gonna right? compounds, yeah mm -hmm. and it's like even if you are like successful or if you feel like you you're on the right path it's like and, and that gets speaks into like mental health right it's especially with like you know speaking personally from in me mental health and a like mexican-american families and then b in like latino men right those things all compounded and that led to this last story really diving into like yeah, like you said, like this place where I was really vulnerable. And I remember writing it and, and feeling like it was this confession. It was this. I, um, I imagine it being scary to write even for yourself. And you knew you were writing a memoir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I wrote it. It was like right in the middle of like the first big lockdown for the like the pandemic. And it was, and a lot of people were like, oh, you have all this time to write, you know, because you're not, it's like, you know, you're home all the time. I mean, like, unless, yeah, <laughs> it's like, no, imagine like all the outward trauma that a lot of us are dealing with. And then like having to revisit this like internal trauma that I had not really like uh, uh, properly, like, what, a, okay, so one of the things I did is like, I, I started going to therapy, like this whole process of of getting it out on the paper it was like I I was doing it for myself but it's like I need professional help like I I need and, yeah. and it's, it sounds like kind of funny to say that because like I think a lot of people there's still this stigma with it that when you say like I need professional help they're like oh you you're admitting that something's wrong there's something right? wrong with you pro but, therapy actually my last uh episode of this show the gentleman I had on left early to go, not left early. He left at the time he needed to go. Um, but he left before the hour mark because he had a therapy appointment. And mm -hmm. like, I think I'm so grateful that people are willing to talk about this publicly. I go to therapy. Um, I don't think there's any shame in that, but um, particularly men, um, particularly um, I, I know because in, in my growing up, there was stigma, um, particularly a man who would have dealt with that stigma. I'm so grateful that you're yeah. willing to talk about it. Yeah. No. Like, yeah. No. I mean, it has to be like re-traumatizing, triggering at least. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when I finally like landed on the therapist that, that I landed on, we 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 talked a lot about like the the issues that would come up when I was writing it, and and kind of the feelings that I had and the anxiety I had. And for for me, the big thing. And I, I've said this multiple times, multiple people. I'm like one of the most stubborn people you'll meet. <laughs> and I think I, I say it in the book, like it's like my, my sister and I are the most stubborn people. And like, it's true. And it's like, I, I think I always knew that I needed to, I needed to get this out. I needed to write about it. And I needed to, um, maybe it was like a, a gift to myself, like being like, I need to write it out. And in the process of writing it out, I will probably actually I have to go somewhere and get some insights and get some tools and resources and like medication and and like really really like 
important reflections on myself and my habits so that I, I can actually be, you know, like to deal with it. And I always knew that was going to happen, but it was like, it was almost like getting comfortable enough with myself and comfortable enough with, with who I am and comfortable enough, comfortable enough to not care what like the haters are going to say. Right. Like, cause it, I mean, like, it's crazy that even, I mean, you start to like talk about small towns, like there there's haters, like there's some big, big haters. Like, it's, it's, not, it's not awesome. real in a small setting too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I had to steal myself for that. And I remember like, like, as I'm drafting it, being like, okay, this is what people are going to like latch onto. This is her, pe- her uh, this is what people are going to be concerned about um, who haven't read the book. Because the, the, pro- the problem wasn't the people who've read it. The problem is the people who have heard about it from other people who have read it, who don't actually see me like navigating this tightrope of talking about myself versus talking on behalf of cultures and families and family dynamics but like they just hear oh man Chewie talked about this or and you know like Chewie's saying this right so like it, it, that was the tricky thing but yeah it, it I, I think it was I'm really grateful that I went through it like went through the process of writing it out and went through the process of getting to a place where I can talk about mental health in a way that that is I think really I've I've seen other Latino men talk about it differently now and I, and like on my in my circles which and and I think it is because like I was able to do that and I was able to to kind of help which I think is also like a really really like important thing Absolutely I I personally, I'm very grateful um, that you put your story out in the world because I, I know people who need this, this book. Um, I know this is just like Sarah loves chewy hour, but, um, but there are reasons that I, that I so adore you. And, and that's because you're doing some really, really beautiful, really important work um, for for the people we grew up with. Um, sorry, I just, uh, when you said small towns that I was like, yeah, and also um, I remembered that I'm, I'm from like one of the big cities that you visit. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right, the, the, the big cities to us, it's like Davenport, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> like, Very exciting. <laughs> they got a Sam's Club. <laughs> I I annoy the crap out of my spouse because we'll be like driving, you know, through the Quad Cities and I'll be like, but that wasn't there. That used to be woods. And he he'll he'll now make fun of me and do that. Like, hey Sarah, did that used to be woods over there? Like, but it, but it, you don't understand. Um <clears throat> Sam's Club did not exist when I was a wee lad. A wee yeah. Lad. I'm sure I do the same thing with like Iowa City, like all the, the the changing landscape, especially when you start to get into the south side of Iowa City and how much that has changed. And 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 I mean, know. I've seen it change, and I haven't been around very long. Mm-hmm. But it's like that, you know, there used to be a Best Buy over where stuff, etc., used to be. Now, now I forget. Now I don't even know what it is. Right, but like. Oh, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or like the Kmart and stuff yeah so yeah the Kmart is a um, trampoline park yeah. <laughs> this is trampoline yeah uh, <laughs> okay so w- one uh is that your kitty yeah she, she's just like I want to get in <laughs> <laughs> he hunts socks and that's the sound he makes when he's bringing me a sock oh he brought you like a gift and he won't let him in my baby okay i'm really impressed you can hear that uh, <laughs> um so censorship has been on on our um cultural minds a lot lately and uh i i understand that you you're um you got a little bit of a little tiny bit of heat about it. Are you are you willing to talk about that? Yeah, for sure. I think it's it's surreal that it would it would happen, and it's a, it's such a like a small example of a, of an interaction. But I think that speaks to like the small townness of it. But there was 
there was a thread and I, I didn't see it. I, it was, it was one of the, I did, I recently did a, a book signing in West Liberty and it was actually one of the, the, like the quote main characters, right. It was a, a friend of mine who I, who was in the, in the book and he talked to me and he's like, Hey, do you hear about this, this thread that's going on on Facebook? And I was like, no, but there was a, a thread about like gifting my book to like the, the high school library and, a, and an individual said, I, I don't think though that that book belongs in the high school library. And somebody commented like, oh, you know, curious why you would say that. And <laughs> no lie, he said, um, and this would be funny for the people who read it, but he said, uh, um, I'm trying to get his exact words. He's like, you know, I don't think they reimbursed that gentleman that they stole the mailbox from. And I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, like that is not the issue that you have. Like, yeah. So it's 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 I, totally... I would be interested to hear what the um gentleman with the mailbox has to say. <laughs> um well, yeah, I mean like I I yeah no, that's not that's not the issue. In fact, you were very straightforward about who who is I'm sorry, this is for for the audience. Um there there's a stolen and there's a there's an injured mailbox um, that figures <laughs> prominently in, in one of the storylines here in um, Chewie's coming of age. And um, you are you are clear about who and where <laughs> this mailbox belongs to. Um, and 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 the various moving parts and and people involved. So um, so it's really silly to think that that could be someone's issue because if someone had an issue with this mailbox, it would likely be the person who owns that mailbox. Yeah. And now they know exactly who to talk to yeah. about the mailbox incident. It's <laughs> not hard to find uh, his family still there. Like, <laughs> And if, he, um, if, if this individual were to, to reach out to me, you know, and it's like 25 years later, whatever it was, and it'd be like, yeah, I'll do, yeah, I can talk to my friends, like, you know, give you like, We'll get lumber. I don't know. Yeah, you know, it's like, it's, like, it's, but the thing, the, the interesting thing about, about this, this kind of whole episode. Okay, so the, the, the person who told me about this was, was, was my friend Josh. He was one of the white Joshes, right? That I, the, the token white kid in our, I'm group. like very into your friends, um, based <laughs> on having read them, not, not having met them. Um, um, yeah, we, Josh had a really good idea. He's like, so on the anniversary, should we do a panel or what? Like have all the people do a panel. I'm like, that would be amazing. He's like, even if it was just us in a room, it would be like- just And I'll throw up some cash to make it happen. (laughs) But I got a really good insight because I, you know, like while I was writing it, obviously it's like, I'm thinking of it from the perspective of us as immigrants or my family, my, my parents are immigrants, you know, and like my- Ruben and Eric and Jerry, like the Asian and Mexican immigrants um, families. But I, Josh told me, he, he told me a couple of stories where he's like, yeah, my mom, who's still in the, in the community, like she got a message from uh, one of her um, like church group ladies that was like, I didn't know Josh was like this. <laughs> and and because like in, in, the, in the book, like we have, there's this whole interaction with Josh and uh, our other friend, his, his like stepdad, his, his like, you know, the person in, in the household was, who was a cop and, and Josh calls him a pig. And if you think of certain groups of, of a small town and how much of a, of a, of a, like a no-no that actually is like, he got flack from it. And so like, it was me getting an insight into like, oh yeah, like, that community is going to be, that's what they're going to get issue with. But the interesting thing that Josh told me was, you know, I've gotten lots of, he's gotten lots of, you know, feedback or whatever and and stuff. He's like, but not one person has talked about like the fact that we were drinking at 11 years old. The fact that like, we, we almost like beat our friend to death at like 13 because we were all drinking. Right. He's like, not one of these, like, you know like older the things people that we should be worried about culturally. <laughs> right? Yeah, right and I think that ties into this whole a it ties into like drinking culture in small town America which is I think is a very very like it's an issue it's so much this is you're 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 saying like a really big cultural point 
and I interrupted it for some reason. No, no. <laughs> it's, it's like, yeah, it's like that. And it ties into like what I think is a really big theme of the book too, which is like the, the, the how grotesque this idea of like boys will be boys is, right? Mm. Like, like we were afforded as boys to do whatever, whatever we wanted. Whereas my sister and, and like the other, like the, the girls in the group or the people who didn't consider. I themselves. loved your, like, you called them something really great. I don't, I'm not going to have the time to find it in here, but um, your, your sister's group of friends were like bad girls or something. You had a great way of referring, to, referring to them. You I did not it. call them bad girls. <laughs> <laughs> they were the mean, they were the mean girls. <laughs> Was it like cholas? Like the, like the badass cholas or like. It might have just been the word badass. Um, I feel yeah. like I would have remembered badass cholas, but because <laughs> they totally um, were. They were. I mean, they were the ones that scared us, right? Like, and I think that that is. Oh, so it's like when I was visiting this this the 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 class that I talked about of the of the grad students, like they had all read the book, which was amazing because I haven't met a class that has read the entire book. And like bringing up my sister and her friend group was like, they were so excited to like, just get more insights into her. And I thought that was really awesome because I totally like, I could tell people like my relationship with my sister, like I'm closest with her than anybody in my family. And I've always wanted to, to write. I mean, like in both of the things that I've been published in so far, like they've involved my sister. And I think it's because she is such an interesting like person and that translates really well to the page because like she just existing subverts so many of of the the like tropes that we have about like femininity and and like masculinity and like who's afforded to to have like autonomy over themselves and my sister's like she's the one that like I, I like I think to bring it back it's like the reason why I wrote the story the book the way that I did and the reason why I could write it is like a lot of it too is for my sister because like she was the one that was like no I this is who I am I talk how I talk I don't care what you think and like that she's always had that and like it's it took me a while to recognize it and to revere it but now I totally do right like yeah she also I mean not she but your relationship with her has a really beautiful arc um which uh something like as a as a human being who I have two points I want to make here maybe three um uh something that kind of annoys me as a as a reader about memoirs is like there's not a narrative art which like duh life isn't life's no storybook um <laughs> but the thing about life is that some things do have do have such a story that you it's not a full circle it's like a 180 that you get from being terrified of her to like uh, becoming I mean you are siblings but like really mm -hmm. becoming siblings yeah. um and that's so important and so special particularly in communities where you're so separated from your parents and also from the people outside you um where you know it should be your siblings who who understand you and your situation best um, but oftentimes that creates greater conflict because you should get me. Why don't you? Mm -hmm. um, another thing I wanted to say was um, it's so interesting and I'm so grateful. I think you said Josh brought this up to you, but no one is mentioning um, anything but times when you subverted appearances. Um, you see, I don't think of it at all as you like outing your small town for being controversial because like I have a television set. Um, <laughs> we know we know that all places are the same. It's just that some are smaller, really. Um, smaller means in my mind condensed. Yeah. Um, my sister likes to quote Gadsby occasionally um, where you know one character says at small parties there isn't any intimacy. And I think that that's um that's something true also of small town versus big city um you you don't have privacy in a small space um and then i think it's really exciting really interesting that you're speaking to a grad school uh, or a class of graduate students about mm -hmm. your story and 
I guess I'm just assuming that these are um, are writers. Am I wrong about that? I think I think a, a good contingent of them were, yeah. So it, it's really saying something that these people are so compelled by the story that they forgot to ask you questions or um, could not get past the story to ask you questions about craft. Um, that's how I think, just more on the Sarah Loves Chewy Hour, um, that's, that's really, really telling about what you're doing with your craft, that the story is what stays. Um, there are plenty of writers, you know, where um, the story was super compelling, but I'm really interested in the writing, or um, the story was nothing, but I'm really interested in the writing, or you can't have one without the other. But what you do by virtue of speaking authentically, and I mean that your language is genuine. Um, I've already said that, conversational. And I think that that's a craft choice, right? I think that uh, what you're doing craft-wise on the sentence level, um, in dialogue, in narrative, is really, really beautiful and important. But because of the way you do it, it comes across so naturally that people are stuck on story. And that isn't, in like the literary world, that isn't something we see a lot. People are much less interested in story and character. And the idea that you can do this with real people, right? Um, God, that's just so awesome. Also, mm -hmm. like, tell Nancy to write a book, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> So here's the here's the other thing about that. First off, thank you so much. That that, that means so much to me. That yeah, it's the the issue the 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 our relationship to craft I think is so interesting, and I I relate it to my relationship with with dance and like the 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 idea of technique and dance. Right. I think and even, Chewy came to dance before before writing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean like. I it 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 was maybe even until like I saw the book cover that I could actually like the considering myself a writer or an author and there's whole there's all sorts of complications with that um but like that could actually like supersede me as a dancer like to this I mean like I'm I'm right now I'm getting back into dance in a way that I haven't in like 10 years. Like my, I have like calluses in my hand from doing like stuff. Like it's, it's super fun. Like it's like, it, I think I'm like relearning how to be a noob at it. Right. But that's all to say, like my relationship with dance has always been this like, like struggle between being technical and being like this, like visceral, like all of energy. Like it's like dance to me is more about an outlet than being like the most precise, best like technician or whatever. And so like, I think that translated to the page really well too, because I wasn't trying to create these, like a lot of people have a, a, like a really, really huge hang up on the first sentence. Like the, especially if it's like, you know, a big like manuscript, whatever, it's like their opening line has to be this like, perfectly crafted like like Rube Goldberg like by the end of it you know it's like I, I think of a I mean like a person who who just like is amazing at opening sentence is like Gabriel Garcia Marquez and I think like the shadow of of Marquez is especially as like Latino writers like is behind us because we're like oh man we have to make that first line like make it like sing for folks right and so like to remove myself from that and just being like as you said like no the story like the the people is what matters rather than like this like sh like me trying to show off <laughs> like like this like yeah no that's it's a it's an interesting dynamic i you you got me with the first sentence as a rube goldberg device um <laughs> i mean it always is right yeah yeah i guess the like, point is to like get someone to poke that first mm -hmm. wow I mean, I've, 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 like, I've read one where it was, like, the first sentence was, like, almost the whole page, right, and it was, like, it was very, I mean, like, and I, I mean, I had, I'm, like, halfway through it, and it's, like, amazing, but it's just, like, it feels like this author took hours and hours on that opening sentence, and I'm, like, okay, like, is, is that, is that just like one approach? Is that something that we all need to do? Is it, yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's an interesting kind of thing to think about. 
I'm gonna say, well, okay, so you you revealed that the prologue was not originally the prologue. So mm -hmm. just skip that and go to part one. Welcome to West Liberty. The first sentence, which is gonna be weird, probably me reading it. Um, the mangled opening guitar licks of Angel Baby by Rosie, real name Rosalie Mendez, and the originals drifted from the tape deck through Ray's garage. I mean, that gets me. The prologue though will like cut you open and make you pause. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, what I've done um, first I feel like I should um, I meant to do this at some point and I'm just going to do it now um, Chewie and I met through um, the Bicultural Writers Fellowship at the Iowa Writers House which is on hiatus from um, hosting things right now but I put a link to the Bicultural Writers Fellowship in the chat on the Facebook page um, Chewy was an issue one. I was an issue two of We the Interwoven. There are three issues out now. Um, I put two links to the book. We heard it when we were young. One from Bookshop, um, which is linked to the Rock Island Bookstore, the Artsy Bookworm, and one to Prairie Lights, which is Chewy's community bookstore in Iowa City. And then um, I put a link to All the Way Up Studio. Do you want to give a little shout out to that? Yeah, so all the way up studio is in North it's Liberty. Like Twenty minutes to remember the name, um, <laughs> and it turned out I had a bookmark. So. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> so it's in North Liberty, not to be confused with West Liberty, which happens a lot. So it's in North Liberty, um, and it's my friend's studio that he opened up a few years back, and it's the first hip hop dance studio in Iowa. So they have all sorts of classes and I haven't been there in a bit because of pandemic and then I had a baby and all these things, but I, I, I definitely am planning to go back and, and be a part of it. And it's just, a, it's a really fun community and like shout out to Joel who, who he did what I did too, where it's like kind of like we always envisioned ourselves leaving like Iowa or our hometowns and, and he came back, like he spiritually came back and he's like, no, I wanna do something here. I want to like set up a dance community for, you know, Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, North Liberty, this area. Um, and I kind of did the same thing with my writing and in my life. It's like, I want to do something for West Liberty, something for the people in this community. You know, as a kid, I talked a big game about leaving and I did leave. I went as far as I could in the, um, in the continental US, right? Um, and I would like talk crap about people who came back or never left, but first of all, don't do that. That's a crappy thing to do and I was wrong. Um, <laughs> you are not superior to anyone, by the way. Yeah. Um, that's to, to former Sarah. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's, there's something about home. Yeah. And there's something, I don't know, that we can get into a whole conversation about like the state of Iowa right now and like brain drain and like the like, how do we, how are we as a, as, a, as like a, a statewide institution going to keep people here? And I would always argue like, who are the people who are staying here, right? Like, who are the communities that are staying here? If you look at like these immigrant families that moved here in the 60s and 70s, their kids are staying here like family means family in a, in a way that that people need to capitalize on and and not to get into that kind of conversation but it, it like I think there's I mean I work at the University of Iowa and I think there's a lots of missed opportunities in the University of Iowa actualizing these these like families and kids that have stayed here for like you know one or two generations now and they're going to keep on staying here because that's where their roots are you know so tangent yeah, I would like to, and I don't think this is like a literary, I mean, it's definitely a literary topic, but um, I would like to really look into what it, what it is about home, um, because there are also plenty of people who go back to their home when, like, their folks are gone, mm -hmm. and um, I don't know, that doesn't, that's like for psychology or sociology. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any, I, I've taken more than an hour of your life. Do you have any any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Um, just again, thank you for this conversation. It was lovely. And I, and I hope that that people got something out of it. I will give a, a, a not, not really a good plug because there's nothing to show for it, but just maybe just keep your like ear out because currently I'm working on the, um, the audio book version of We Heard It When We Were Young. Um, and it'll be out on, 
all major, you know, you can get on Audible, iTunes, or wherever you listen to audiobooks. Uh, so. Libro FM. That's that's the one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that'll be so much better than me recording sections and sending it to people <laughs> and hoping for the best. <laughs> I gave this book to my um, to my brother-in-law, who's not a reader, uh, and in my, I, well, you inscribed it and then I inscribed it, um, and I wrote, um, this is for, this is for Francisco, but really, uh, it's also for Julia, because I require you to read it together. <laughs> oh. Um, Okay, so um, no spoilers, but uh, since I know everyone hanging out with me had a great time with Chewie today because Chewie's the greatest, um, Chewie will be back. Chewie will be back. Um, And with that, I will give some updates on the Midwest Writing Center and let everyone have a wonderful day. I'm opening my calendar as if there's new information in it. (laughs) Um, All right, so first and third Saturdays of every month from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Time, I host a workshop group called Writer Studio here on Zoom. Um, anyone is welcome. We try to workshop based on what it is you want from your work rather than um, asking you to fit your work to our tastes. Um, something to keep in mind, that is not the most traditional workshop format, but I do personally believe that it is the best way to get what you want from your writing. Um, and you are you are the boss of your, your own work, so it is for you to make those decisions. Uh, coming up on Write More Light, which is Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1 p.m. Central. Um, that's when it live streams on Facebook, of course. You may be watching this on YouTube, in which case it's on YouTube at about 2.30 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, we're going to have um, Wes Kransky talking with us about writing and illustrating children's books. Coming up, we're going to talk about um, reading outside your comfort zone, which would be um, from, you know, cultures and perspectives you're not used to, but also like genres that you've never read before. Um, My personal goal for 2020 was to read genres I'd never read before. Turns out I got a lot of opportunity to do that. Didn't see that happening when I made the goal. Um, And so now I feel like there are some, I've got some, some cheat codes for how to navigate that. Um, We had to postpone our uh, our workshop called the heart work of writing it will start on next what what day is it next week on the 23rd with Tanea Winder she is an absolute all-star of a poet a public speaker author musician she's got a TED talk you can you can look up um this class is for women and femmes that really gets into um generative territory figuring out why we tell stories what we want from ourselves and um and making it happen generating new work in, um, let's see, the 25th and 26th of this month is our Iron Pen Contest, which is a 24 hour writing competition. You pay $10 to register at 5 p.m. on Friday the 25th. We'll email you or put up on our website and all our social medias the prompt. You've got 20, <laughs> I was gonna say 25, 24 hours to, uh, to write the best thing you can write, poetry, fiction, or nonfiction, or all three if you're really ambitious. Um, will after the fact we'll have an award ceremony anyone who enters who registers at all is um entered to win free tuition to the collins writers conference this summer which is a really big deal i can't tell you who we have lined up yet but there's a lot of really excellent names um uh where was i um those who place in that writing contest are offered publication in our literary journal Uh, writer's block and um, everyone is welcome to read at the everyone who participates is welcome to read at the award ceremony Um, following that uh, we're gonna have some really good write more light episodes in March but I'll announce those next week Um, in April we've got a class called a crash on flash a flash flash fiction (laughs) writing workshop and um Oh, there's a lot more to come. It's it's gonna be really great. We're got we've got um, April, of course, as always, is um, National Poetry Month, so we're gonna have some great events with that. Um, work with some local institutions. Really, lots of great stuff coming up. Uh, I'm out of breath, so please, um, thank you so so much, Chewy, for being here, and thank you for um, you know writing your book, for willing being willing to be vulnerable, for being willing to be authentic. Um, And as always, dear everyone, please write more light into your life. Thanks, Sarah. Still alive.